the healing energy never loses its power or essence. And so even when I send a recording to somebody for their healing, they'll go back and listen to two, three, four times and hear things they didn't hear the first or second time so that layers of healing keeps happening. But I also believe that if somebody else listens to it, that those words are there for them too and that energy is going to integrate in them. So yeah, I believe that the energy, it might not integrate right at that moment, but it's there to integrate when it's ready for that person who's listening. Hi everybody, welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. It's where we blend spirituality and practicality to help you live a life of purpose and joy. Today, we have energy healer and medium Deborah Martin with us. I'm going to be asking Deborah about her healing techniques, her three near-death experiences, and how she helps the FBI and law enforcement officers solve murder cases. Please remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and share this episode with your family and friends. Now, let's go chat with Deborah. Miss Deborah, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited you're here with us today. I am so excited. Thank you so much for having me on your platform. Oh, my honor. Let's get right into it. You say miracles exist and there's always hope. Nothing is too big or too small to heal. Please say more. Well, I really believe that. I think that we put expectations on like titles, right, of, of what a illness is and you hear something like ALS or Alzheimer's and automatically we go, what? And so I, I really believe that we put those expectations on. God didn't make the, that term. We made that term and that anything's possible. So we just have to open our hearts and our minds and, and receive that. And so it can be from the smallest thing, like somebody could come and act like, oh, you have a sore throat. And they're like, she's picking up on a sore throat and and they might have cancer at the same time. But we go into see, seeing through the body what they're all dealing with. So it could be the smallest thing to the biggest thing, but everything's possible. Yeah. And everything can be healed is what I always say. It is. Everything can be healed. There's really nothing that can't be. But all, and with that said, I'm not like God who makes that decision because maybe there's something that they need to go through as a life lesson or that that's just their their soul contract, uh, you know, you don't know. So I can't guarantee every person's going to be healed, but I know that every person's touched. And I know that as they are touched, they're receiving something that they need. And maybe it's something that they didn't even think that they needed that was more than what they were asking for. Well, sometimes the healing is the emotional side of the equation too. To your point about, I, I always see that we can heal body parts, but there's always an emotional component that's part of the healing equation. And and I agree with you oftentimes, all the time, it's their spirit is wanting to explore and experience whatever it is they're going through, whether that involves physical healing or emotional healing or whatever. Certainly it's spirit working through us and with us to help that person heal themselves. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. I think it's emotional, physical, or spiritual. And a lot of the emotional trauma does go to the root issue of why they have the physical, right? And so when we're talking emotional pain, emotional pain can be one of the hardest pains to heal because, you know, that it's almost like it's ingrained into you. That's who you became because of that emotional trauma, right? So I always say we, we don't want to forget it because we learned through it. It was an opportunity for look for growth, but we want to heal it so that you can move forward from it. And so when I do a healing on somebody that has mental illness and I see like instantly, I have one on YouTube that she talks about, she had 20 years of pain. She tried committing suicide three times. She, she lost all hope. And after one healing session, she, everything just lifted. And she's like, oh my gosh, I can see the light. And, and it was like, to me, I'm just the instrument. So when I hear the feedback like that, I'm like, oh God, thank you, God. Right? And, and that's just, that's the beauty of it. It's just stepping aside my humanness and allowing the, being the instrument and allowing that frequency and healing energy to go through me. And what's beautiful is I'm shown things. I don't know anything. Most times I don't know anything what the person is dealing with, but I'm told. And so that makes it really profound because 
then when they listen to their recording, because they're in their own sacred space as it's taking place, when they listen to it, they're like, how did she know? Right? But spirit, God, source, whatever you want to title it, knows everything about us. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's interesting, too, how people, I would imagine, come to you, they do to me, especially on the healing side of the equation, when they've seen multiple doctors, gotten multiple diagnoses and perhaps multiple treatment plans, and they still have the same symptoms. And so that leads them to look outside of the traditional medical box, which there's always application for. If I'm in a car accident and I'm bleeding out, you better take me to the closest trauma center. Don't chant over me. You know, I mean, like stitch up my artery that's been cut. <laughs> 100%. I think we have to use every tool in our toolbox, that's right? That's right. It's part of the healing equation. And, and it's interesting, too, how... I believe, and I'd love to hear your take on this, that nobody heals anybody else, not even the doctors. You know, you have surgery, and at the end of the procedure, they're stitching up the incision with sutures and staples. Well, they don't make, that surgeon doesn't make your skin grow back. You make your own skin grow back. Then that's the same thing with this. That's a be- beautifully said. I like that. You know, it's the same with healing, um, like your bone, like you have a broken bone and you, you're taking the time to heal it. You're taking the time, time to nurture it. And it, it's, it's really hard when people have cancer because you're, you're healing your cancer within, but you don't get to see it heal like a bone would start to heal, right? And so that comes into a whole other play of trusting, just trusting what you're feeling and guiding. And sometimes, you know, the cancer doesn't heal. You know, I've seen that too. And they receive on a whole different level where then they're able to embrace where they're at and they know that all is well and will be well no matter what. And so I think that frees you. It frees you from the pain. It frees you from the worry. It frees you from the stress. So that's a whole nother level. I agree. And I say everything can be healed and sometimes the healing is death. Yeah, yeah. I've had that. In fact, in my book, I write about um, Brenda and Brenda had come from cancer and we really thought she was healed. Like she felt amazing. Even all her friends were saying, oh my gosh, you just look like yourself again. And we went to a root issue and for her her healing and it was trauma. She had um, trauma from her parents. And I can remember God saying, you know, we're going to release this trauma. And she wrote me an email that said, you know, that was more important than cancer because I've held that all my life. So when she did pass, she said that I'm passing, but I'm not holding any of this. I've released this. And so it's just so much more freeing. And so as the healer, you're going, wow, that's pretty profound, right? That she came for the cancer, but she got something more. Mm -hmm. Cancer was the vehicle for her to to reach what she wanted. (laughs) It was... Growing up and even as an adult, my mom, God bless her, she would go light candles in church and we called them killer candles. When somebody had suffered for years or, or, you know, for where it's just in excruciating pain and the docs couldn't manage their pain and it was like enough already, you know, this person was so ready to go. And so my mother would go to church and she would say a prayer and she would light these candles. And I'm telling you, Deborah, these people would die within usually 24 or 48 hours. And so we used to tease her about it. We'd say, Mom, are you going to go light one of those killer candles? But I think it was a situation where there were so many people praying for that person who was in such agony and the person was ready to go. They were telling everybody they were ready to go and, and the family was suffering and everybody else. And I find, and I do this with my call-in show, I always tell people, envision what I'm describing as part of this healing because it's similar to the power of prayer when we're all focused on the same person or the same situation, we're sending energy to them. Do you you have something you can add to that? A hundred percent. So I do a free monthly um, global community called Army for Love. And so we're joining and putting love into action. And so we have no judgments. 
But at the end, top of the hour, we do a mini healing. And so our intention, you know, we're holding hands. I do this in my global group sessions too. We're holding that intention of a miracle, right? So I believe when one receives, we all receive, but that energy heightens. And now we have that same intention. And that intention, you know, becomes really profound. And I think people own it more that way too, because it's like, well, I'm not deserving, that person's deserving. But if they're collectively together, they let go and go, okay, well, let's see what happens. Well, and I think too, to your point about people who aren't, don't feel deserving, oftentimes, and I've had many, many emails over the years of people saying, I was listening to one of the episodes of your show and you were doing a healing on somebody with whatever the symptom was. And this was three years after the episode had aired. And they said, and I got a healing for the same symptoms that your caller had. And it was three years after you'd done that healing. And so I always say, well, time doesn't exist in the spirit world. And I would imagine that you've run into that many times as well. Can you give us an example of that? Yes, I can, because I believe that the healing energy never loses its power or essence. And so even when I send a recording to somebody for their healing, they'll go back and listen to two, three, four times and hear things they didn't hear the first or second time so that layers of healing keeps happening. But I also believe that if somebody else listens to it, that those words are there for them too and that energy is going to integrate in them. Um, many times, I'm sure when somebody reads your book, like they read mine, they go, oh my gosh, I resonated that. And I felt like I was being healed through those words. Words are powerful and that energy is powerful. And I believe that it never loses its essence. In fact, I'm starting to put my Army for Love mini healings for people to be able to access because I'm seeing miracles happen right in front of us. We might have a hundred people on the screen and we're all witnessing it happen. Well, what happens then? Later on, when they turn off the Zoom and they go doing their stuff, they're like, wait a minute, Deborah said when one is healed, we're all healed. And this this gentleman had been healed of a neck injury instantly. And all of a sudden that night, she's like, wait a minute, I have more range in my neck. Oh, I was healed too. So yeah, I believe that the energy, it might not integrate right at that moment, but it's there to integrate when it's ready for that person who's listening. Yeah. And with whatever their journey is and what their spirit wants to explore and experience in this lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about what you do. Let's say I'm a client. I sign up for a session with you on your website. Tell us what's going to happen next. Okay. So I have three choices that you can sign up for. One's a group session, which is people gather around the world and we do a group healing session. Now you'll send your picture in. Um, you might want to tell me what's wrong with you. And this goes with a private healing too. So you, you send in your picture. Um, you might want to tell me what you're dealing with. You might want, not want to say anything at all. And so what I do then when the healing, the day of the healing, I will go into prayer and I'll either read what that person's dealing with and place it into God's hands, not limiting it just to that because it might be so much more. But placing those intentions out, saying, thank you. Thank you for healing these. Not asking, but giving gratitude for it, for what's coming. And then um, then they're in their sacred space, right? They, they might be sleeping because it's a different time zone. They might be working. They might decide to take a walk. They might be able to rest and say, well, I want to try to receive and, and feel what she's feeling at the same time. Now, I'm, this isn't live. It has to be totally sacred time for me. So then I go on a healing table. And if it's a private session, I place that picture on my abdomen so I become their proxy. If it's a group session, we're all guided and the pictures are all around me. And so then what I do is I tap into a frequency and healing energy that I call God. And I see that as a, a beam of light, right? And I believe that God is love. So love heals. And so I always go to the solar plexus and I say, okay, this is where it, the light's going to go in. Things will come out through that beam of light and go up to the universe, but it will also come through different parts of the body. So now that I'm tapped in, I might start seeing spiritual surgeons show up. Now, 
people go, well, I don't want just a spiritual surgeon to show up. I want just God to do that. Well, God uses the spiritual surgeons, works through those spiritual surgeons so that I can see exactly what's being done. And I will feel it. There's no denying it. I will feel, I can see them cutting. I can feel the pain. I can go, oh, somebody has something in their knee. Oh, somebody's dealing with heart trauma. It, there's so much going on at one time that it's like, I couldn't talk. Like it comes through me. There is never a breath or a break, you know, like how you, you pause to think. No, it just keeps going, going, going. So then um, when the session's complete, then I send that recording to you wherever you live. And then you can sit when you're ready to receive and listen to it. So that becomes yours, your healing, and you can listen to as many as you ta- many times as you wish. Now there's an add-on that they can do because I use my mediumship abilities. An add-on would be in a private session, they'd say, well, I want a reading too. I want to connect with a loved one. So that morning, I will start connecting. I ask the relationship of who they want to because I want to have a direct connect. I don't want to be like, well, I'm going to bring all these other people. They go, well, I really didn't want to talk to that person. So let's just get right to it. So then... I'm like, okay. So then I get all the information. So then I go into the healing room. I do my prayers. And then the beginning of the session, I'm going to give them all the messages. But now I'm going to also welcome that loved one into the healing session. And what's so beautiful about this is I might see them. And when they're in their sacred space or whether they when they listen to it, they see them too. Um, some people have said they saw the nurse with the, the garment on. Some people say they felt their loved one hold their hand. And messages will still come through. But when I'm dealing with a loved one, we we get to go to a sacred space that the loved one um, chooses and, and prepares for them. So whether it's another dimension or it's it, it, they see the landscape, they describe the landscape, they have an embrace, they might smell them, they get to speak with them, they hear more messages from them, and it becomes really healing. And... Um, it's, it sounds like it's so far beyond and it kind of is, but it, yet it's so like every, at, at the end of every se- session, I'm like, wow. It's like watching a movie. You're like, wow. Can you imagine what just took place? That was awesome. And then, then Madison who works for me, she's like, well, tell me about it. I'm like, it's like, whoop, it's almost all, all gone. Right. Because it came through me. And so I can just remember little bullet points, but they truly are miraculous, and each and every one of them touches my heart. So, yeah, they're they're profound. They're they're beautiful. They're heartfelt, and and I just come from um, my heart with each and every person because you know what? I just you can feel them. You can get to connect with them on a soul to soul level. I think we're sisters from a different mister. <laughs> I think so because you keep going. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's here's my stuff. First of all, there's always surgeon spirits in the room when somebody's in the OR. Guardian angels over the head of the anesthesia. And I'm an inventor of surgical devices, so I spent a lot of time in the operating room in my 30-year career. So not only did I scan them when I was in the OR, you know, developing a new product or testing a prototype, but I see it remotely now. That's number one. There's always surgeon spirits over the head of the actual surgeons that are performing that procedure. I just love that you say that because um, this is so important because people have so much fear going into surgery. Right. And I always say, okay, we'll pray and the spiritual surgeons will work through your physical surgeons. Right. They're all there. You'll be surrounded in a white light. And with you saying that you work there and that's what I say, I think this will be great for viewers to hear just going, just take a deep breath and know that's your that's your God time. That's your time just to let go and let them all work on right, you. Right, right. And trust that the surgeons that are the physical surgeons, you know, they're going to do their thing. When I've had to have surgery a couple of times in my life, I said to the surgeon before they wheeled me into the OR, I said, hey, I have every confidence in you. Do your thing. And it went great. And I healed really fast. And it was it was effortless. So that I did the same thing. I try to say I yeah. try to give gratitude to them and the whole thing s- switches. But I also believe that I've seen the spiritual surgeons and spoke with them and they said they used to be physical surgeons, but now they can do even more on the other side. So they same just thing. continue. Same they thing. like to do. Same thing. Yeah. I got the same thing. 
So then there are all kinds of other spirits that are in the room and they form like an amphitheater at the foot of the operating room table. So it's deceased loved ones and all these other spirits that are in the room. And so I'll describe them to the to my client who's the patient. They'll go, oh, yeah, that's Grandma Betty and that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so. And there's always a correlation between how much prayer is being said for the person and how many spirits are in the room. So I always tell my clients if they're having surgery or, or you know, a friend or family member, I always say, get on every prayer chain list. Doesn't matter what the denomination is. do not matter. You just get on every list that you can. When somebody who's dear to me is having surgery, I was on the board at this mother house of nuns that educated my son. And they're in, I think, 68 schools they run. They're on all the continents. You know, I mean, they're all over the world. <laughs> and I'll call up there and I'll talk to Sister Mary, whoever. And I'll say, hi, sister. Can I please put an intention on the big board? And they know I know what I'm talking about because I've done it. And the big board is prayers go out to all of their schools, all of where those sisters are. So you not only have all those sisters praying, you got all those kids in all those schools around the world praying too. And Like um, bring them on, right? Like bring, bring them on. In. You know, I mean, get the Swahili's praying for you. Get the Jews praying for you. Get the Lutherans praying for you. It doesn't matter. Just and get on. Is, I, I really believe like at the end of all my sessions, like when I'm doing them live on Army for Love, I always say, put your hands out now and let's give back to the world. Right. Because if, if we're all that same intention, it will be felt by somebody. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. what you're doing is let's just spread it. Exactly. The other thing is when I have a healing done on me by my mentor, who's now in her 80s, I, when I used to be with her in person, and now we just do it via Zoom since COVID, and I see the same thing. I'm laying down on a massage table and all my deceased loved ones' spirits are there with a couple of other spirit guides usually, and oftentimes religious figures are in the room as well. And even my late dog is in the room and she, she's on her hind legs and she's got her little paws up on the table. So it's all spirit, God, working through all these different entities, which are all a fractal of the divine. So as I see it as it's spirit working through all of them, and they show up in different ways for us so that it can help us understand it from a human perspective. Do you? 100%. Okay. 100%. And I, I also do healings on animals. And so Joe. our language becomes universal. Yeah. So I start to hear them and they're like, I can remember um, if you know Suzanne Wilson. Yeah. She's amazing. I've had her she, on the show. And she had Baron and Baron had a healing session. And Baron told me he wanted lavender. And I go, I don't use oils. He's like, I want lavender. It's going to make me calm. I'm like, okay, let me search for some lavender oil. So I did. And so I mentioned that in the recording, like, okay, this is what we had to do. I had to start off. Well, she almost fell off her chair because she says that's what she puts on his head every night before he goes to sleep. Oh, wow. So I had to test it. I tested on my dog. Like, do all dogs like lavender? Like, could this be like something that Everybody was like, oh, well, everybody likes that. Oh, no, I got that out for my dog. My dog's like, get it away. Get it away. What do you need to do with it? So it's it's amazing how, like you say, they work through, they have a voice, and they it becomes universal. Like when we're on the other side, when I had my NDEs, I wasn't talking like I'm talking to you. I'm right. talking to my mind. Right. And that's the same. And I, I really think with our animals, whether it's a horse, a cat, whatever it is, we are t- talking to them we know what they need they they get that signal to us so we're already talking that way yeah i want to talk about your three ndes but first i have pages of questions for you girlfriend (laughs) so first i want to hear about did you come in seeing dead people as a child did you learn how to do this stuff what was your path and did you come from a spiritual family I did not come from a spiritual family. In fact, I kind of went to all different churches and my mother was Protestant, my dad was Catholic, but all my friends were different religions. So I would kind of go with them on Sundays. And that that was kind of neat because I was seeing how each one was connecting, right? Um, at the age of four, I started seeing spirit. 
And I always think that, you know, when they're around that age, children four and under before they go to school, because once they go to school, that brain changes, right? And so I started seeing them at night. They would come to me at night. And I used to be really, really scared and say, I don't want to hear, you know, I don't want, I don't want to deal with you. I don't know you. What? And I would take my, like my head this way and I would just scratch like his name's Steve. I'll start with an S, you know, and just take my mind off of it. And I didn't know that you could say, you need to leave me right, right now. Right. So years later, it wasn't until I was on another interview that somebody asked me the same question. And, you know, it, it really made me look back and go, well, they were there to protect me. They were there to not to hurt me, not to scare me, but to give me this awareness. But I did turn it off. I turned it off because of fear. And I tried to talk like, can I come downstairs, mom? I'm scared. Nope, just go to bed. It wasn't something that, that it was talked about back then. We didn't talk about mediums and spirits. So you didn't want to be the odd one out talking about that and looked weird. So I, I closed off for many years. Yeah. Well, I wrote a children's book series of four books because I had so many moms and grandmothers say to me, uh, can you explain, you know, can you help me explain how my child knows information? There's no way they would know because they can't read yet. And how do, how does my child know information about past lives? And we corroborate the information with online historical, you know, documents and things. And, and what do we say to a small child when somebody dies? And we say, well, grandma's in heaven. And they say, no, no, she's not. She's laying in that box up there in the front of the room. And, and so, yeah, it's been my experience that, that children, everybody comes in with the ability and children are told by parents or grandparents or teachers or even friends, that's not real. It's just your imagination. And they learn to shut it off. So many of them, although I'm seeing that change, are you as well, that more and more people are, are saying, okay, there's something going on with my kid. Is this real? I do see that, but I, I also try to tell them, don't try to, you know, like, be gentle with it. Let them tell you. So many parents want to be like, let me ask, like, you, can you ask grandma this question? You know, don't Good push point. Them. Good point. Yeah, just push them. Let them be open, free, feel safe to say what they need to say. And then if they don't want to say anything at all, that's okay too. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Give them one of my books, one of my children's books. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they were designed to do. So let's talk about your NDEs. Not one, not two, but three. What, yes. what, what? Tell us about the individual ones. And also, I'd love to know, is there some kind of a recurring theme that goes through all of them that threads them all together? I do believe that all of them have led me to where I am today. Mm -hmm. I look back at them and say, okay, each one gave me a certain lesson, but it molded me into who I am. So if you can look at something that's tragic and look at the blessing that comes out of it, mm -hmm. you, know, you might not see it right away. So in my first NDE, I was, it was the same night that Princess Diana had her accident. So I was a single mom and I was out with some friends and it was on the TV. So you're watching it. And you can remember that impact like, oh, you know, what about our children? So I remember when it was time to go home, I had this premonition. I didn't know what a premonition was at that time. It's like, don't get in the car. So I was like, I don't think I'm supposed to get in this car. My friends are like, oh, it's just because you watch that, you know, Princess Diana and you're a single mom, just get in the car. And I, it was a two door sports car. So I was getting to the back seat. And so on the journey home, we had to take the freeway and we were in the slow lane. And I, felt something was going to happen. I felt like we were going to be hit. How I knew that, I do not know. It just came to me like, you're going to be hit. And at that moment, I said, no, no, no. I, I'm a single mom. Please save us. And bam, we were hit by a big truck that, you know, one of those trucks that didn't have windows on the sides. And it came from the fast lane and just took us out. We spun out and took 40 feet of guardrail out and just came facing oncoming traffic. But the car is squeezed. Um, um, there's, I don't even know how we even fit. I was in this little pocket, but we couldn't get out. It was crushed. And so all of a sudden, um, somebody came miraculously to our door 
opened it effortless, carried each one of us to the embankment, and I had this ring on my finger that was bent, and it was a really strong ring. If you put all your weight on it, you can't bend it. And I was like, it's crushing my finger. My finger is bleeding. Can you help me get this off? He took it and put it in his mouth. So I have the t his teeth rings to show he was real. But he kissed me on the forehead and said, I will see you again. You will be fine. And he went to the left. But at that time, all the fire trucks, we had like three fire trucks. We had ambulances. They were all coming to the scene to the right. So I went to look to the right. You know, that's just normal. When I went to the left, he was gone and no one ever seen him. So that led that whole thing. Where, what was this person? What just happened? Why did I see that? How, you know, all these questions. And I started going to conferences, Doreen Virtue, Wayne, Wayne Dyer, and kind of learning, you know, about the afterlife. It opened that door again. And then years later, when I was like a week after I was um, proposed to, to my former husband, but he, I was going to a friend's house and I was in a left turn bay, just waiting to go into the neighborhood. Not, no premonition, no nothing. And a man had a diabetic seizure. The police were like following him, trying to get him off the road. I am what stopped him. And so he was going about 75, 80 miles an hour and he just rammed me. I didn't feel anything. I just was all of a sudden out of my body, looking down at what was transpiring. And I saw the car swirl and I saw like a big truck carrying tractor equipment coming and was going to go over me and crush me. At that same time, I heard these strong a strong voice behind me saying, are you ready? And I said, and I knew what that meant. That meant to stay here, to, to, to pass, to transition. And I said, no, 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 no. Life is too good. But I have three children, once again. I need to go back. And before, I said, but I'm not going to survive that. Before I knew it, I had police at my door. I was in, once again, the back seat of my car. All windows were blown away. My four door was now crushed into like a two door. And I can remember the police officer saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I had a mouthful of glass. I couldn't speak. And then he looked to the gentleman next to me and he was like shaking and he's like, are you okay? He's like, no, I don't know what just happened, but I should have crushed her. I was driving that truck and something took my steering wheel and put me into oncoming traffic. And it at that moment, it downloaded. I saw that. So, you know, everybody's going to the, the ER. Every, Helicopter for Life is coming in for the other gentlemen. And um, I walked away. The, the hospital never checked for internal injuries, nothing. They're just like, oh, you're fine. You can leave. I'm like, really? Really? So I ended up having a neck injury for a little bit, but we, we were able to um, get that fixed. But Either way, that opened up my mediumship because now I'm hearing spirit and, I, and I'm taken to a different place. Where is that place? Who was that that was speaking to me, right? And so that opened that door. And then a few years later, um, I think every, the floodgates opened from when I was a child and I was just hearing and, and dabbling into the mediumship. And then I got tested at the, well, it was the Veritas Center with Dr. Carrie Schwartz and Dr. Julie Beichel, which is now the Winbridge Center. But um, I had to use science to say, is this real? Is what I'm getting real? Is, you know, and be tested. And I think the science gave me that backbone to know, like, okay, yes, what you're getting is absolutely a connection, a strong connection. So then we go to my third NDE, which um, this NDE. I was sick and, and dying, and doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I was um, in at Mayo Clinic being seen, going through every single test. And I was laying in a fetus position in bed, just going, there's no quality of life. I am, I've lost my dignity. I can't keep my bowels. I can't eat without any pain. I can't drink without any pain. And no one was finding anything. So I just started saying, you know, God, I'm ready. 
which if I think about it now, you know, I had three grown children that were out of the house, but I still had a daughter that was in second grade. How do you, how do you say that? You know, but I was, I felt like this is no quality, not quality for my family, not quality for me. And I remember one day, spiritual sur- surgeon showing up in my room and I'm like, well, I'm not afraid of them, right? Because I see I'm a medium. So I'm like, all right, well, maybe they're here to, to work on me. Well, I remember the pain being super bad. I can remember them like cutting open my le- the right side and going in with a tube. And I can remember, I don't know if I can, I can bear this pain. And so I was like, well, I can. I can do this. I'll just take my mind away from what's happening. And I took a deep breath. And I was like, okay, just relax. When I took that deep breath, all of a sudden I extended and I went up out of my body. And I just kept floating like, well, this is nice. I don't have any pain. I like this. I'm good. All right. So I get to a place where I I feel like I'm where airplanes are. You're on, a, on there's a whole bunch of clouds. I'm just on these clouds. I'm like, I'm all alone. Okay. What's going to happen now? Now I see this beam of light coming towards me. And I, it felt so calming and so filled with love. I recognized that. And now I, re- I remember seeing that while I was looking, this beam of light turned into who I say is God. God comes in many forms. So I don't like to try to describe exactly what I see because you may see something different. But he was holding me, he was carrying me this time. And my ear was, you know, over his arms. And I was like, now I'm watching as a soul level what's happening to my body. And so I follow. And he takes my body and he puts it on a beam of light. And there's a coffin next to it. And I have to tell you, the coffin was really pretty, like a snow white glass coffin. I'm like, do you think I could just like sit in there and see what it's like? And I'm like, Deborah, don't even ask. So you probably shouldn't do that. So I wasn't even put two and two together. Like, you're going to have a choice here, right? So I remember following him and like, where are we going? We're going to this dome. And I said, why do we have to go in this dome? It was full of questions. And it's like, because what I'm going to say to you is only for you. I don't want the universe to hear it. So it was like, we were going to be into this, this space. And while we were there, we were having a conversation. And the conversation led me to sit down at a table and I saw my lifeline count contract. I couldn't see anything from um, from this day forward, right? It, it stopped. And so I was told I needed to come back with a new mission. And I'm like, well, what's that mission? And I saw some words. One was prosperity. One was voice. One was, you know, healthy. Um, and so I was like, okay, voice means mediumship. I can do that. And it realized health not only meant me, but to heal others. So on the bottom line, it's like you need to sign this because um, you were a living on borrowed time and now you're going to go back, but I want you to remember this day and you're taking the oath. And so it was one twenty one twelve, and all those numbers are reversible. He says, remember this, everything is reversible. And so I, when you're hearing this, nothing's really, you're downgrading it, but you don't really understand it all, right? So I said, well, can I see my parents while I'm here? Like, I'd really love to see them or some loved ones, you know, come on. And I was like, no, 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 you can't because then you'll never leave. You can't see anyone. That was not why I was there. And so um, God signed the line too, which really made an impact for me later in life because I had to make some really hard choices. And I knew that, okay, I'm not doing this and making this choice by myself. And so when I came back, I can remember coming back in my body and I can remember almost like, you know, when you do and you inflate like a mattress, you see the air going in. I can remember coming in like that. And then I can remember like, oh, taking a big deep breath, almost like I was held underwater. Like, and when I did that, I'm like, am I different? Am I, am I the same person? Like something just miraculously happened. Now I didn't instantly heal. It wasn't like I came back, surgery's done, everything's fine. It took about six months. And I really spent that time loving my body and writing things down, like in a journal, like, is there something that I'm holding on to that needs to be released? And there was. And so I worked on that, but then all of a sudden, 
I was feeling that as I was healing myself, I was learning how to heal. And so now I'm like, well, how does this work? And God led me each step of the way to show me that this is God taught me how to heal. And through God, these this is how these sessions work. So I can't say I take ownership. I'm just the instrument and vessel. But um, when I presented this to my former husband, he said, this is too big for me. I can't, I can't do the walk with you. And we were, we were inseparable. We had a great marriage, great family. And people are like, well, if you can't survive, like don't do the work, stay, don't do the work. But I made an oath and I knew God would have my back through it. So I had to lose everything I owned, my entire foundation. Um, I was scared because I was like, how am I even gonna eat? You know, how am I gonna survive? I didn't do this as work. So it's like, now what do I do? But I think that's why I had to be that way so that God said, no, this will become your work. This is your mission. And the, and I'm going to walk you through each step of the way. And it took many years for it to build upon itself, but I never lost that faith. And I knew that I, I made a commitment. And, but I also knew that I would always have what I need when I needed it because I had God's back. And that's a big message for people. You know, don't lose that hope because you'll always have what you need when you need it. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. I got, <laughs> I got a bunch, I got a bunch <laughs> of questions for you. First of all, as you were telling the NDE stories, each one, your aura, your energy field got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it got really big on this third one. So anybody that has the opportunity to watch this video of this chat, Pay attention at this point to Deborah's energy field. It's very visible around your whole body. And um, and I believe anybody that's watching it will be able to see it. It's massive right now. And especially on the third NDE, my whole body was tingling. I was going, oh yeah. What's the what's the agreement about with God? I love that everything's reversible. But I've never heard anybody say that they, especially in an NDE, where they were asked to sign an agreement and take an oath. What do you think that's all about? What have you What have you come up with in the years since that happened? I think it was just to say, you know, I'm going to stand in this. If I'm going to be a healer and do God's work, that I'm going to stand, put myself 100% in. I can't be half in, half out. And so I think that's where the oath comes in. Uh, I also was given my, in you know, a life back, you know, I could have maybe passed away and not had that mission. So uh, I think the agreement between God and I was totally out of love, but I think it was molding me into who I, I am today. Had I not taken that oath and had signed it, I don't know if I would have took it as serious and I may have had one foot in, one foot out, and it, I would never be the healer that I am today if I only did it halfway. And so it, it, it had to be that way. Now, I've I've seen other people that I've done healings with. There was a little boy, um, and he had leukemia, and he was completely healed, but he made an agreement with God. And his parents were part of that healing, and they, they witnessed it all. And we saw him go completely healed with not one trace of cancer in his body. And he had only two weeks to um, live is what the doctors were giving him. So the doctor was calling him a bit of a miracle. A um, bit? A bit? A bit. A bit. Yeah. Mm, yeah. A bit. Well, um, he ended up passing eight months later. It came back like, like out of nowhere. And... I look at that as what he gave his parents during that time, the spiritual journey that they were all in and the awareness. He he did this for his family so that they would be able to cope the love that he has. And he loved life. And, but he was so smart. He was a healer himself. I believe that he was a master himself because he could heal at age seven. And he would say things like, if he would go in for a biopsy, he's like, well, saw grandma. And we're like, his dad would say, did you go to heaven? He's like, no, I went to another dimension. It wasn't heaven. And I'm like, okay, this kid's smart. 
And so it was wonderful connecting with him. And now I connect with him on the other side, but it wasn't what we hoped for, right? We thought this is forever. But the amount of time that he did get to stay, he he kept saying, I'm still a miracle, right? I'm still a miracle. And we're like, you are a miracle. You 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 received the miracle and you are a miracle. So, um, but it's never how we think it. Well, and it's been my experience and I've heard this probably tens of thousands of times from Spirit and I'm eager to hear if you have as well, that that there's no right or wrong, there's no good or bad in this Spirit world. It's just an experience. And from our human perspective, we look at that and go, why in the name of God would anybody choose to have a child that's sick and dying and eventually passes? And yet, in heaven, what I've been told is they're saying, oh, this is interesting. What are they going to create out of that? How's that going to unfold? It's not that it's already scripted. It's that the basic premise is there. And then our free will helps us navigate how it unfolds. I'd love to hear your take on all of that. I feel 100% what you're saying. And it is our humanness where you're having a human experience. So when they go to the other side, they're not feeling the same feelings we are feeling. So some people be like, well, if I'm grieving all the time, are they sad? No, no. They don't have those human feelings like that. They're they're there to protect you and love you and have those feelings though. So many people say, Don't don't cry. Don't, you know, your children don't want you to. No, no, no. That's part of your healing. Emotions are real. We have to feel to heal. Um, but when we do go to the other side, it's so much different and we see the grand picture. And I really believe when we did that healing for him, he saw the grand picture and he knew it, his soul level knew it. And he became all of our teachers during his eight months. Do you think that he experienced the healing and then had that eight months and he was kind of like, okay, been there, done that, ready to go? kind of a thing you had that thought I don't know because I mean that would be hard to say because the parents would be like he's ready to go he loved his family he loved to be here on earth um I do know that the healer that he was here he continues to do on the other side you know I, I've seen him awesome pop into one of my sessions and it makes me cry seeing him like oh my gosh so I don't know how he felt because I think he tried really hard to stay. And because he was a healer, he was mad at his body because he knew, like, let me just tell you, he would go into surgery and say, can I use my magic? And we're like, yeah, you can use your magic. And they tried to put him under and he would fake it. And then he'd open his eyes and they're like, you need to, you should be down. He's like, well, can we play another game? And so they'd give him more and it wasn't working. And she's like telling the, the, the dad, like I gave him enough to put down an elephant. This should not have happened. And so he was that healer and he's like, I can heal my body. But sometimes even as a healer, our body isn't healable, right? Sometimes it's, we have the vehicle that is not gonna heal. It's just part of our time. And so I think he was frustrated with that because he knew that he had the capability, but his body was like saying, nope, it's done. What I'm hearing from him in my head yeah, is uh, he, what I said. He experienced the healing himself, which is part of what he wanted to come explore in his human perspective. And he knew he could do more healing work from the other side, from heaven. And so... He keeps telling me, it's kind of like you go to Disneyland and you're right at ride, like the blue, like the, you know, Matterhorn or the, or Space Mountain or something. And you experience it. And then it's good when you do it again, but it's never like the first time. And he's saying, he's saying, I experienced that. I learned a lot. I, my family grew as a result and I knew I could do more, way more healing from heaven. And so that's why he went. I and, think he, he yeah. can't do more. Absolutely. It's interesting that you brought through a roller coaster because they 
just went for his brother's birthday to an amusement park, and the mother said that she went on a roller coaster. And it was the first time that she was able that she found herself laughing for the first time. Yeah, he was showing me a roller coaster at Disneyland. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah, and it wasn't at Disneyland, but it was still at an amusement park. Yeah, yeah. Either, you yeah. picked up a roller coaster. I'm sure. Right. That's. I'll have to tell the mom to listen to this. Well, the other thing that's interesting, and I just had this with a client this morning whose husband had passed a couple of months ago, and they had his celebration of life just yesterday. And her 26-year-old son was on the call with us. And we we were talking with their dad and husband in heaven. Who, he was a character, Deborah. I mean, this guy was hilarious. And of course, they were deep in grief and so sad. And the first thing out of this guy's mouth, out of his spirit's mouth, was ask him about the turtle. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> And you know, I know you've experienced this. They come in with this random stuff and you just want to go, the turtle? Really? Because their loved ones who are still here are waiting for them to say, oh, I miss you so much. I love you. I'm sending you, you know, love arrows. No, he's like, ask him about the turtle. Very first thing. So I said to them, he wants me to ask you about the turtle. Does the turtle mean anything to you? And they both started laughing. They cracked up. And he said, yeah, we had a turtle that showed up in our yard that was about 15 pounds. It was a tortoise. And and we named it Toby. And then when Toby laid a bunch of eggs, we needed to change Toby's name. So, oh, that's hilarious. So we changed his name to Tobitha. <laughs> and, and Tobitha was with us for, you know, pretty much all of this son's childhood. And, um, and what did it do? He got them from the sad emotion to got them laughing right out of the gate and then said many more funny things. And I said, this that's guy. That's what they want us to do. That's what they want us to do. They and do. This guy and was, we can feel the pain, but we can allow ourselves to have that laughter too. Yeah. And and he was just character. I mean, like a smart aleck character at times, sarcastic, just hilarious. And I said, that's because he wants us to know it's really him with whom we're conversing, first of all. And secondly, the messages that he kept coming through with was when the wife said, well, what am I supposed to do now? You know, I've taken care of him all these years. And he said, look for the joy in everything. The son was asking for career advice. He said, look for the joy. It's all about joy. It's all about having fun on your life path. It's all about search for the joy. Go to things that are fun. Go to things that feel good. Even to the point where they were saying, we don't know, we don't know what to do with his ashes. He was telling them exactly what to do with the ashes, but to scatter them in multiple places and make it like an adventure. You know, like like go out in the middle of the night, like you're sneaking into the place and sprinkle my ashes. And and it was hilarious. And they said that was his personality. But it was all about have fun, find the joy. It's interesting you say that too, and that he said that because that's what I always say: like, find one piece of joy in every day, no matter what that is, because that raises our vibration, right? Right, and it helps us communicate with our loved ones in spirit, because spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels because the vibration is too low. Well, and just think of it: it's like having a heavy blanket right? It's heavy. And so they can't get through. Let's just remove that heaviness and just let it be. And, and you'll, you'll connect with them. Uh, and that's why I think some people that are grieving really heavy, they'll say, I, a loved one didn't come to me yet. I've been waiting for them in my dream. I can't hear them. Sometimes when we try too hard, that's one thing. But another thing is maybe you just need to heal for you right now. And that heavy blanket, when it comes off, They'll be there, but they're still there even though you're wearing the heavy blanket. I use the analogy of our heads are big satellite dishes and they receive and transmit frequencies. And when we're grieving, we're on the, the old time country music station where they're whining about mama, the truck and the dog. And then and spirits communicating on the disco channel or something that's really high energy and fun. You can't listen to disco music without being in a good mood. It's just not possible. And and so it's just a different frequency. Let's change directions for a second. 
You use your psychic abilities to help solve murder cases. I want to hear about that because I've done the same too. So I want to compare notes. So the first murder case that I did was Channel 3 here in Arizona wanted to bring in someone to my home that was a totally coal blind. Like I would know, not know this person. Let's just film it. And they didn't know that the person was dealing with a murder person. They just thought this person wanted to talk to their aunt. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to connect before and get all this information. They set up their cameras. People come in and she's sitting there and I'm looking at her and I start to talk to her about the aunt, you know, all the things that she came like, you're worried about your bangs today. And she's like, and you just had them cut. So now you're not sure if you like them. And she's like, yeah, that was yesterday. And so she just was letting her know, like, this is me that's speaking so that when uh, she had to tell me something that was difficult, she would believe it. Right. Right. So I'm just going on just like we would, you know, having a conversation, spirit coming through. And all of a sudden it was like a movie. It went, Crossed my face, literally saw it. And I went, shoot, shoot. I gasped it, gasped like, oh my God, how do I tell this to her? So I was basically saying, I need to tell you something, but I'm going to try to do it with as much grace as I can. But I want you to know that she's fine. You heard from her. She's fine right now. Okay. But your aunt's telling me that she was murdered. And the lady looked at me and she's like, I had kind of a nudge thinking she might. And I've, I went to like something with the heart and something with the stomach. And she's like, well, they told us that she had a heart attack and stomach cancer. And she's like, mm -mm -mm -mm. so now she showed me how, why they killed her. She showed me the two people in descriptions. She said there was a picture of like she knew this man and that he's wearing a blue shirt in one of the pictures with him and that she gave a name and she gave a description of how tall he was and the whole bit. Well, at that very same time, all of a sudden, I, these, these people were from Peru, right? So more darker skin. I see a Caucasian man pop through and I know he's not for them and I go, there's somebody here. And I looked at the camera guy. I go, Scott, there's somebody here for you. Their phones went off. Boom. Two helicopters have crashed. They were our helicopters. They had crashed. And that was one of the guys in the helicopter. Boom. So when he went back to the station to the very moment that I saw him was the very moment that that impact happened. So now they pack up. Now that's traumatic. And we say goodbye. Let it go. And you know how that is. You just kind of like give the information. You have no idea of what's going to come out of it. it was six months later, I was actually taping for Disney. Disney was going to do a whole spiritual channel. So they were at my house and I get a call. And um, her name's Marita. She calls. She says, Tepra, Tepra, Tepra. Do you remember me? I'm like, how could I forget? And she goes, I was walking down the, the street and we found Marcos. We found him. And he um, admitted to the crime he's going to serve 30 years in prison. So then they say, you know, years later, will you come? We're going to make a movie out of it here. I go, no, 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 no. I'm not coming to Peru because the, there was a mafia that was involved in this. And I'm like, I want nothing to do with that. So it was out of my control what was coming through. It wasn't like I was just going to sit down and go, let me solve a, uh, a mystery. It just came to me. And so they did exhume the body. And she said that she would would give the gift of, to the aunt that she would be play her part in this whole investigation. When they pulled the body up, the coroner was like, this body could not have been buried for three months. All the organs were intact and the blood was still good. And they were able to see that she did not have stomach cancer and that she did not die of a heart attack, that she died of asphyxiation, like I said, said. So it was pretty, pretty profound. And it kind of took me by surprise. So I, I, I've helped other 
situations that I've done healings with. I, I did one in Australia and it was a, cl a closed case. So I went to an FBI agent here in, in the United States and had him come to come to my house and he took down all the notes and he took it to his superiors and they were able to bring that case back open in Australia. So, um, but I haven't gone seeking like going to the actual department, you know, the, the police department and working one on one only when like that producer always seemed to be like, okay, I have another one. Can you do this one? And I would do it like that. Yeah. Great. Well, all of the investigative, investigative departments, the CIA, the FBI, I mean, all those guys, a lot of, po lot of big police uh, departments do utilize psychics. The federal ones have psychics that work with them. And I know that for a fact. There is one that was on the news. News can be hard for me because then I start to see things. So there's a gal that went running in San Diego and she was running this path all the time and she was abducted and they were trying to find her. Well, I saw where she was. So I was able to call that actual department and I said, this is where she is and you found one of her shoes and she's right underneath that embankment. And he goes, how do you know that? That's not out in the news. How do you know we found that shoe? And I said, I explained I was a medium and that I should have recorded the whole thing. I didn't. And that's if anybody's working with as a medium, remember to record everything. So I gave him all the details. He went and did what I did, found the body, took all the credit, and he would not release that that he got help from a medium because he told me, I'll be laughed at. Now, I didn't need the recognition. But I felt like that was really sad because the family might have been able to then reach out and maybe I could connect with them, right, with with her and them. So it was, it was sad in that he was so open to taking all the information, but he used it for his own benefit. Either way, the body was found, which is what, what's, what was important. But if I had it recorded, you know, I could say, I recorded this, you know, so maybe he would have told the family. That's the only part that I wish the family would have known. Mm -hmm. Well, and we don't know too, maybe the family wouldn't have believed it anyways and would have that would have been more traumatic for yeah, them. Yeah, you have to kind of trust the process of it all. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I had a gal call into my show, this is several years ago, and a friend of the family, their daughter was missing. And I saw her on a bike the last time that anybody had seen her. She had she was riding, she was on a bike ride. She was an athlete and she was riding a bike and I saw a car force her off the road and she went into a cornfield and um, I gave them latitude and longitude coordinates and I could see a highway and I could describe what she was wearing and all of that. And then I heard back from the caller the following week, or maybe she sent me an email, I don't remember. She said, yeah, we, we got that information to the police and the police, you know, was able to find the body. And one even more interesting, I live in Birmingham, Alabama, and there was a college student named Natalie Holloway probably 20 years ago. I did that case too. That went to Aruba. Yeah, I did that case too. I still have a file on her. Yeah, and I ended up sitting next to her mother on a plane. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so we did an instant replay of what went on and I gave her a lot of information and 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 then I never heard back from her. But when it came out, what they had found and and all of that, it it was just boom, 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 spot on. Life. It was the same way. And I had I actually was traveling to Aruba, and that was with my former husband. And I said, "Oh, we'd be walking." Go, that's the hotel she stayed at. He's like, "You don't know that." I go, "No, I feel it." So we actually walked in, and he said. Can we just ask was not did Natalie Holloway stay in this hotel? But like, yes. And he's like looking at me like, okay. So I was getting a lot of those downloads there too. And I thought, well, if they ever reach out to her, if I have a, a connection, I have the file. But now now it's all done, which is so great. Right. Well, and I th and the mom had told me, I don't remember her first name, and I didn't hear from her afterwards, but she told me that she had had several psychics and mediums who had reached out to her and were giving her 
little bits and pieces. And she said she had a psychic file. I was kind of like, here's what I've gotten from this person. Here's what I've got from that person. Well, you do anything, right? Anything yeah. that you can. And that, that was so traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. I just it was felt, really. I felt for the mom, the dad, you know, Natalie and her friends having to leave the outer, like the whole thing. Everybody was and I don't remember if she was in high school or college. She may have been in high school still. I, I just think she was in high school. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right. I could talk to you for hours. I got two other questions for you as we're winding down here. You are just a delight. So why do we incarnate? Why do you think we incarnate? Well, I think we, one, could have a choice to come back. And maybe there's lessons that we want to learn that we didn't get the first time. Some of us might never have experienced love, right? And we're like, I want to come back and I want to have that experience. I've had a child that came and felt the love right from the womb and said, okay, I felt it. I'm checking out. And the mom's like, you know, that gave her peace of knowing like, okay, now I understand that this child, that's all they needed. Um, I also feel that maybe after we incarnate so many times, um, We've, we've learned everything and then we say, oh, I don't want to go back anymore, <laughs> you know? But I think that we're here, it's an opportunity for growth and learning. And so many people out there just are like, I just want to live in this space. I don't want to know anything about, I don't want to learn. I don't want to have any spiritual guidance. And I can't imagine not being connected in this world. I can't because it seems, it gives me the guidance. It gives me hope. It gives me um, love, it's support. And if you take all of that away, you're doing it all on your own. And then, you know, that's where hopeless comes. That's where, you know, I don't know how to, I get stuck. Um, and so, yeah, I believe that the coming back is for an opportunity of growth and maybe they didn't want to open up the first time. And they're like, I did that wrong. I want to come back and now feel it from both sides. Yeah, different set of variables sometimes repeating a similar script has is, is been my experience too, where they're looking at things from different sides. Okay, so that, that's a question for here. So some people get upset when they're like, okay, so someone that may have shot someone, they get to go to the other side, right? Um, so then when they come back, are they the person that gets shot? Not necessarily. They may be. They. It's been my experience. They may be. They may be the police officer involved. They may be a doctor involved. They may be the daughter of the son of the grandmother of the whatever. There are a bazillion different roles they can but play. But it plays out. Shows again. Yeah, I feel that too. I do. So some people are like, well, you know, they need to. I don't know. Get their hands slapped, and, and maybe it's no. They just need to come and learn the lesson. Well, they're looking at it from a different perspective. And I use the analogy for multiple lifetimes and and we all live kabillions of lifetimes has been my experience. But I like to use Hamlet as an, as an analogy because you think about how many times has Hamlet been performed since Shakespeare wrote it in 1602. Who knows? Same script, but different language, different time. What was happening in the world? Who were the actors? Who was the set designer? Who was the costumer? Who was the producer and the director and all of that? And so it's the same basic script, basic premise, different perspective. And I believe that's what we do in our lifetimes. And who knows whether or not I believe that it's certainly feasible that we incarnate on earth. And then who knows whether we incarnate on gal in galaxies far, far away. I think I think that's certainly feasible, and I've seen it when I've been working with different clients, and I think, that looks like a Star Wars set, or that, that looks like something I've seen in the movie, and then I think, okay, well, yeah, George Lucas was channeling all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and speaking of Disney, Disney has a whole Star Wars section now, and when I was there a few years ago, I was thinking, okay, I've seen this before in my mind's eye in working with clients. There's just so much, right? There's just like, there's just so much more than what we can humanly understand. And that comes with healing, that comes with what's going on in, in our world, the outside world, the afterlife, everything. And so it's fascinating. And I just say, be open to everything and all. I agree. 
And I love getting to talk to people like you because I, we're all saying the same thing. We're all having similar experiences. And this is the first time I've ever met you or talked to you. And so there's no way we could be making this up. And and to your point earlier, how the information comes in really fast when you're getting the, I call them divine downloads. Same with me. I, I'm like motor mouth. I'm going, okay, blah, 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 blah. here's the yeah. hand. Here's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and, and I, I just think we, we're not that creative. You know, we, we can't make all this stuff up and talk so fast about it because the, the cadence of your speech, I would imagine, and certainly my speech is faster. It's sped up because the information's coming in so fast. So you got to get it out. That's how it is in the healings too. And yeah. I always say those same words. You just can't make this stuff I up. Know. I know. <laughs> Absolutely. How can people learn more about you and your work? They can go to my website at goldenmiracles.com and they can, you know, see anything on my social media like YouTube. I have a lot of testimonial videos where, like we said, if they're listening to it, they could tap into that energy as well. Um, and then um, Instagram and Facebook as well. I'd love them to follow me because I'm always trying to put inspiration and hope out to the world. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, it seems to me like you're doing a magnificent job of it. Well, same to you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I've really enjoyed this it, conversation. It's been a delight. Like, I feel like you're one of my peeps, right? And we've been friends for a long time. So thank you. I agree. I agree. All right, everybody. That's it for today. Sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama. Mwah! And from Arizona, too, where Miss Deborah is. We'll see you next time. To enhance your spiritual journey, click on one of the videos below and remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your family and friends.